Welcome to Build Through Time. Have you ever looked up at a towering skyscraper and wondered not just how it stands so tall, but how people actually move through it? We often take vertical transportation for granted, um, but it's been this silent yet really powerful force in shaping our cities. Today, we're embarking on an incredible journey through history, exploring how the humble elevator literally lifted cities off the ground and you know, continues to redefine our urban landscapes. We're going to trace the fascinating story from ancient hoisting mechanisms right up to the cutting edge automated systems of today, revealing the ingenious innovations that made living and working way up in the sky not just possible, but actually desirable. It really is a story where technology, economics, and, well, human ambition all came together. What's striking, I think, is how these seemingly simple inventions allowed for a complete rethinking of how we use space. They drove urban growth in ways that were previously, frankly, unimaginable. We'll unpack the key breakthroughs that let buildings push past those traditional height limits and what that means for the future of our, uh, our vertical cities. Okay, so let's unpack this. Let's rewind way, way back to the very beginning. When did humans first figure out how to move things, or even themselves, vertically with some kind of mechanical help? Well, the earliest reference we know of takes us back to uh, 236 BC. The Greek mathematician and inventor Archimedes designed a basic hoisting device. It used ropes wound around a drum, turned by manpower, using a caps basically, you know, a large rotating cylinder, kind of like sailors used to hoist anchors. Right. And the Romans, they certainly scaled those early ideas up, didn't they? The right. Colosseum, completed around 80 AD, reportedly had something like 24 elevators. That's incredible. Absolutely. And imagine the logistics. Each one could lift about 600 pounds. They were moving gladiators, even wild animals like lions and bears for the shows in the arena. Wow. Yeah. And it took about eight men to operate each one. It's just amazing. So from these ancient examples, you kind of grasp the fundamental challenge, right? How do you safely and efficiently move people and goods against gravity? But these early methods were notoriously unreliable. Fraying ropes, uh, mechanical failures, they were common, which made using them for passengers pretty much unthinkable. So fast forward a bit to the Middle Ages. Did things improve much then in terms of vertical transport? Not really. Not in terms of safety anyway. In that era, you'd find these sort of rudimentary nets and baskets used in castles, monasteries, often for defense or moving supplies. But you can imagine the swinging, the instability. They were dangerous, essential sometimes, but definitely risky. And then... Okay, fast forward again to the 18th century. Royalty gets involved, but maybe not for the most practical reasons. Ah, indeed. The 18th century saw elevators become these tools of, well, royal convenience. King Louis XV had a flying chair put in at Versailles in 1743. A flying chair? Yeah, for uh, discreet visits with his mistress. It was a small cabin, moved with pulleys and counterweights. Apparently, he liked the idea so much, he even had flying tables installed at Choisy above his kitchen. Servants below could load them with food, ensuring privacy during meals. Okay, so maybe not solving urban density issues just yet. Not quite, but they were these early, maybe luxurious signs of a desire for vertical convenience and privacy. A desire that centuries later would really drive urban design. Right. But the true revolution, the one that really impacted cities, came in the mid-19th century. This was the pivotal moment, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Transforming elevators from risky hoists into reliable people movers. Before this, you had hydraulic elevators using water or oil pressure, but they needed deep pits limiting them to low-rise buildings. Mm -hmm. And cable elevators existed, but like you said, no safety mechanism. If that cable snapped... The car just plummeted. Yeah. That inherent danger meant widespread adoption for people just wasn't going to happen. It was the fundamental block to building taller cities. So while the basic idea was ancient, safety was the real game changer. And the breakthrough came from Elisha Graves Otis with that incredibly dramatic demonstration. 1853, World's Fair in New York. He stands on this elevated platform has the rope cut with an ax. Can you imagine? And then shouts, all safe, gentlemen. His safety brake kicks in, stops the fall in just a few inches. The crowd must have gone wild. The genius of Otis's invention, which he patented in 1861, was its, well, its elegant simplicity. If the rope failed, a simple leaf spring automatically released a catch. 
This pushed lugs little metal pieces into notched guide rails on the sides of the shaft, stopping the fall almost instantly. So clever. It didn't just improve an industrial tool, it revolutionized it. It built public confidence, making mass passenger transport suddenly safe and viable. And this breakthrough had an immediate profound impact on cities. The first safe commercial passenger elevator went into the E.V. Howe & Co. department store in Manhattan in 1857. And that changed everything, right? Suddenly, prime real estate wasn't just the ground floor anymore. Exactly. It shifted completely. Before, lower floors were valuable because they were easy to get to from the street. Now, the top floors, the penthouses, became highly desirable. You got the views, you escaped the street noise. It totally reshaped how urban space was valued. So it really flipped the script on property value. It did. The direct consequence of Otis's safety break was, well, nothing short of a paradigm shift. It wasn't just an elevator improvement. It was the essential enabler for skyscrapers. Without that safety break, the modern high-rise city, you know, housing millions, attracting tourists to tall buildings, it just wouldn't be possible. Okay, so the elevator was critical for getting people up, but building sky high needed more than just that, right? It required a whole new way of constructing buildings. Before skyscrapers, buildings relied on these thick masonry walls to hold up the upper floors, which limited height to maybe five or six stories max. Right. So the elevator solved the people problem, but engineers still face the structural problem. How do you actually build tall enough to need these things? The answer came with the parallel development of internal iron skeleton frames. French engineers in the 1860s were already experimenting with wrought iron plate girders. These allowed for stronger structures, but with much thinner walls. And in America, James Bogardus, often called the father of the American iron skeleton frame, he made some really pivotal contributions. Apparently, his experience with a big New York City fire in 1845 pushed him to build a fireproof cast iron factory in 1847. That's right. And his factory was the first multi-story building in New York with an all cast iron front and likely the first American multi-story building to be completely iron framed inside and out. He developed better bolted connections too, making the framework much more rigid than earlier attempts. He basically flipped the British system instead of masonry protecting iron. The iron exterior was the protection. And he didn't stop there. He also came up with a new way to clad these buildings, which was just as revolutionary. Mm -hmm. The curtain wall. Exactly. Bogardus invented the masonry curtain wall in 1855 for the McCullough Shot Tower in New York. It was built on landfill, which couldn't support heavy masonry, so he built this lightweight iron frame. And here's the genius part. Instead of thick walls supporting the building, the lightweight iron frame supported its own thin masonry exterior, the curtain wall. A total paradigm shift. It massively reduced weight, freed up the ground floor, and allowed for heights that were impossible before, especially on tricky sites. And it's fascinating, isn't it, that this innovation, often called skyscraper or Chicago construction, later on actually started in New York City. So by the start of the Civil War, you had Bogardus' iron frames, you had Daniel Badger's multi-story grain elevators using similar tech, and you had Otis's safety elevator. All the pieces were there. Right. The only thing missing was, well, the demand for such tall buildings. And then boom, that demand just exploded after the Civil War. Economic growth, soaring real estate prices, especially in cities like New York and Chicago. Property values in New York City alone jumped over 90% between 1860 and 1875. Wow. And ironically, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 also played a part, pushing for new non-wood construction and encouraging taller buildings with innovative designs. It certainly did. Now, consider this context. The home insurance building in Chicago finished in 1885, 10 stories, 138 feet tall. It's often called the first skyscraper because it used structural steel in its metal frame. But New York had its pioneers too. The Equitable Life Assurance Building, built back in 1870 by George Post. Many historians consider that the first constructed skyscraper. Why specifically that one? Because its extra height was made feasible only because of the elevator. It allowed more rentable floors, offsetting the high land costs. It really highlights how central the elevator was to making vertical growth economically viable. Okay, so the technology's there, the demand's there, the race to build taller kicks off. And this led to really distinctive architectural styles in New York and Chicago, right? Very much so. Chicago style, often called the Chicago School of Architecture, produced these large, solid, box-like buildings, sometimes called palazzo style. They typically had ornate ground levels to attract businesses, then simpler upper levels with strong vertical lines. 
often topped with light courts or atria for shops and restaurants inside. So function meets aesthetics, sort of. Exactly. Architects like Louis Sullivan were balancing commercial needs with design. Lavish ground floors to draw people in, but maybe less intricate detail higher up where it wasn't as visible or necessary. And New York. New York initially lagged a bit behind Chicago. They were slower to authorize metal frames. So New York's early skyscrapers tended to be narrower, more eclectic towers. Sometimes criticized for maybe lacking elegance compared to Chicago's solid forms, but they were definitely aiming for sheer stunning height. Right, reaching for the sky. Precisely. While Chicago focused on this kind of robust, functional elegance, New York's denser urban fabric and maybe a slightly later start pushed its skyscrapers towards these slender, ambitious towers. Despite some early criticisms about their eclectic look, they really prioritized vertical dominance, becoming landmarks. Think of the Flatiron Building from 1903. Iconic. Yeah. Then the Singer Tower in 1908, briefly the world's tallest. The Metropolitan Life Insurance Company Tower in 1909, also briefly the tallest. And then the magnificent Woolworth Building in 1913, the Cathedral of Commerce. Amazing names. But as these buildings soared higher and higher, new problems must have started cropping up. Not just for the buildings, but for the cities around them. Oh, absolutely. The criticism mounted pretty quickly. Skyscrapers were breaking up skylines, casting long shadows, plunging neighboring streets into, well, perpetual shade. And traffic. Congestion. Huge congestion issues at street level. Plus, there were ongoing concerns about fire risks, even in supposedly fireproof buildings. The Baltimore Fire of 1904 really highlighted that risk, even though Baltimore didn't have many high-rises then. So what happened? Did they just stop building them? Well, the pressure led to reform. Chicago actually banned new skyscrapers over 150 feet in 1892, partly due to an economic slowdown and worries about having too many office spaces. In New York, they obviously kept going taller. They did, but they responded differently. New York eventually passed the landmark 1916 zoning resolution. This was huge. It didn't ban tall buildings, but it encouraged that iconic setback or ziggurat style we associate with New York. Ah, uh, the wedding cake look. Exactly. Buildings had to recede, step back from the street line at a set angle after reaching a certain height. The idea was to let light and air reach the streets below. And that directly shaped the look of those amazing Art Deco skyscrapers from the <laughs> interwar period, right? Like the Chrysler and the Empire State Buildings? Absolutely. It allowed for incredible architectural creativity while trying to bring some order and harmony back to the cityscape. It created those striking silhouettes, a brilliant compromise, really. Yeah. Now, the Great Depression definitely slowed things down, but it also gave us those two icons you just mentioned, Chrysler and Empire State pushing the limits even further. Though the Empire State famously became the empty state building for a while in the 30s. Due to low occupancy rates, yes. A tough time economically. So let's fast forward to today. We now have mega tall buildings over 600 meters high. How on earth have elevators kept pace with those demands? The advancements have been phenomenal. It's all about improvements in safety, robustness, quality, definitely space efficiency, and sheer performance. We've moved way beyond steam and early hydraulics. Now we have highly efficient electric motors and even linear motor systems. These allow multiple cars to travel independently in the same shaft. Multiple cars, one shaft. Yeah, that's incredible technology. And beyond just raw speed, there's a huge focus now on the passenger experience, comfort Comfort, convenience, reducing anxiety, that's all paramount. I've seen those systems where you punch in your floor before you get in the car. Right, automated destination dispatching. The system intelligently groups passengers going to similar floors, optimizing the journey, reducing stops and travel time. We also have double-deck elevators. They actually first appeared way back in 1931, but now they're much more sophisticated, carrying significantly more people in one shaft. And even super double-deck elevators that can adjust their spacing for different floor heights. Wow. But with buildings getting that tall, safety, especially evacuation, must be a massive challenge. How are designers tackling that? That's a very astute point. The sheer scale makes traditional stair-only evacuations really problematic, if not impossible in some scenarios. That's why new building codes are increasingly pushing for elevators to be a key part of occupant evacuation plans, not just relying solely on stairs anymore. It requires specially protected shafts, backup power, specific operational modes. It's complex. Makes sense. And this evolution isn't just for passengers and skyscrapers, right? It's happening in industrial settings, too. 
Oh, absolutely. The advancements are just as profound there. Industrial elevators are crucial for construction, manufacturing, logistics, moving materials and workers. And automation is hugely optimizing their performance now, making operations more cost effective and efficient. The focus has really shifted to smart features. Like what kind of features? Well, for energy and cost saving, you have intelligent systems that adjust power use based on demand, cutting electricity bills significantly. Then there's maintenance. Smart diagnostics, predictive sensors, they track wear and tear in real time. They can send reports before something breaks down, preventing failures and reducing downtime dramatically. Proactive rather than reactive. Exactly. Safety is also hugely enhanced. Automation minimizes manual control, reducing human error. Smart alarms, real-time monitoring. They detect risks much faster. And finally, performance. Features like remote handling, destination control for cargo, operators can manage transport from a distance, schedule lifts efficiently. The elevator becomes a real logistical tool. So the future seems to be all about smarter tech, more energy savings, and an even smoother, more intuitive user experience. Things like voice commands, maybe even fingerprint scans. It's a world away from Archimedes ropes and capstans. What an incredible journey we've taken, from those ancient hoists to these intelligent, high-speed automated systems. It's so clear that elevators are much more than just a convenience. They really are the literal and figurative backbone of our modern vertical cities. And the question for the future, I think, is how will these ongoing innovations in vertical transport continue to reshape urban life? Consider how this relentless push for smarter, more sustainable, safer elevators will influence not just how high we build, but the very fabric of our communities. They're not just moving us up. They're elevating our aspirations, really. They allow populations to grow denser, new tourist attractions to emerge, and cities to become hopefully more accessible and dynamic for everyone. That's a great point. So next time you step into an elevator, maybe take that extra second to appreciate the centuries of human ingenuity and innovation that allow you to just effortlessly ascend. It's truly a testament to how we continue to build through time. Thank you for listening to Build Through Time.